This is a review on the Canon EOS R5 for wildlife photography. I've been out in the field rigorously testing the Canon R5 on wildlife for the past eight months now. After spending three months living in Yellowstone National Park photographing wildlife and making multiple trips to the Smoky Mountains, I've been able to put this camera through its paces and have developed a comprehensive review on what I believe to be the best wildlife photography camera Canon has ever produced. Now this is a mirrorless camera. It retails for $3,899 US dollars, has a 45 megapixel sensor, can shoot up to 20 frames a second and film in 8K raw video. And I'm gonna be looking at these features among others to showcase how this camera performs as a wildlife photography camera. So getting right into it, the first thing that I wanna talk about here is sensor size and image quality. Like I said, the Canon R5 has a 45 megapixel sensor and with the sensor that large, you get a couple of different things. You not only get an insane amount of detail retained in every photo, you get tack sharp photos and you also get the ability to crop, heavily, heavily crop, which obviously for wildlife wildlife photographers is super helpful because we can't always get as close as we might want to to our subject but if we have those 45 megapixels that allow us to crop in a lot we don't have to be as close to the subject because we can just crop in and still retain a ton of detail. So to kind of showcase the quality of the images that this sensor produces I have a couple of example photos here. Um, this is of a bighorn sheep that I took in Yellowstone National Park. And you can see here when I zoom into 100% if I go ahead and uh, I'm going to drop the highlights a little bit. Um, besides that it's a raw file I just want to do that to make things a little more clear but you can can see here that this camera has captured an insane amount of detail. You can see every individual strand of hair on this goat's face. If we zoom in all the way to 300%, you can see them in even more detail and you can even see the detail in its eye here. You can kind of see the outline of the landscape right here, the sky and the sun up here in its eye, which is just insane the amount of detail that the R5 has captured here with those 45 megapixels. And uh, like I said, every individual strand of hair can be seen here. And overall on you know the fur here on the horns with those 45 megapixels, pixels you can really pull out every little detail on an animal pretty insane what 45 megapixels and a good sensor like this can do for your image quality and as I stated earlier this also allows for a lot of cropping because you have so many megapixels so if I go in here and I look at uh, this photo that I took in Wyoming of a grizzly bear this is again the raw file nothing done to this besides increasing the exposure a bit so that you could see it better um, and you can see here that the bear makes up a very small portion of the frame typically on most cameras when you took this photo you wouldn't really expect for it to eventually turn into a tight wildlife portrait because you know you just can't crop in that much but on a camera like the r5 you can but if you see when i zoom in here to 100 percent uh we've still got a lot of detail maintained on this bear we can still see you know kind of the individual uh strands of fur on it you can see the detail in the eye when we zoom into 300 percent, we definitely lose it a little more it becomes more noisy and uh not as sharp but still, we're retaining a lot of detail here. And if we take a file like this and we use the modern sharpening and denoising tools to uh, you know, sharpen up and uh, remove all the noise, you can actually really create pretty great wildlife portrait out of a photo that is you know, this far zoomed out. Um, you can see that here with the processed version of this photo. When I zoom in here, you can see I've sharpened it. And while it's not gonna be as tack sharp and as detailed as you get on you know, your, your huge files, like the one of the bighorn sheep that I just showed you, you're still going to retain a lot of detail. I mean, you can still see all the fur in this animal. You can still get the nice catch light in the eye. You get some detail on the nose. When you do a little bit of work on this post-processing, you can turn it into a pretty solid wildlife portrait that, you know, is, is honestly passable to post on the internet, to share, to maybe even print, um, which is really just insane. That wasn't a capability that we really had prior to cameras like the R5 that are such high megapixel, but with 45 megapixels, you can crop in so much on these files and it really just increases the range with which you can safely shoot an animal and still get high quality detailed photos of it. And uh, that is one of the greatest benefits of the R5, especially when you're shooting dangerous subjects like grizzly bears um, and you're not able to get close to them. Those 45 megapixels allow you to crop in and still capture detailed shots of these animals, which is pretty darn awesome. Now, oftentimes with high megapixels on cameras, you get poor high ISO handling capabilities. You know, as the megapixels go up, the ISO handling capabilities typically go down. But that's not really the case on the R5, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. The R5's high ISO handling capabilities, because again, for wildlife photography, this is gonna be something that's very important. We're often shooting in low light, and we're using fast shutter speeds to be able to stop that action. So we end up having to raise that ISO up a lot, so you have to have a camera that can handle ISOs pretty well 
to be sure that you're getting clean wildlife images. To showcase this, I have a few example photos. Um, you can see this one here. This is the raw photo, no editing done to this. Um, this is a grizzly bear in Yellowstone National Park. And you can see that I shot this at ISO 8000 and it's pretty darn underexposed, which obviously isn't good because what I'm now gonna have to do is uh, bring the exposure up in post-processing, which typically introduces noise on photos like this. And when you're already at ISO 8000, noise is not a good thing. You can see when I go ahead and do that and I bring the exposure up, we actually don't see that much noise. Um, I can zoom in here to 100% and you definitely see some here, but you still get a tack sharp photo with extremely high detail in the fur, um, sharp eye, detail in the eye, detail all around the face right here, smooth background back there. You definitely are getting some noise in it, but when you zoom out, the noise isn't even that noticeable. And uh, you know, shooting at ISO 8000 on the R5 is really no problem. As long as you're not cropping the file too heavily, you can easily get away with shooting at ISO 8000 on this camera. And you can even see if I go over to this file, which is the finished processed image, um, and I've done denoising and sharpening and all that on this, you can see that there's virtually no noise left over, no relics and no sign that this was shot at ISO 8000, that it was noisy. And uh, especially when you zoom all the way out, it looks like just a totally clean image that was shot at ISO 100, which is just insane. I mean, you can shoot on the R5 all the way up to 8000, get a 45 megapixel file. And after doing a little bit of post-processing, get a file that looks like it was shot at ISO 100. That is something really, really special about this camera and really something incredible that Canon has pulled off to be able to have a camera that handles high ISOs so well with such high megapixel counts. And uh, to showcase this again, just a little bit more, you can see this photo that I took of a Grizzly 399 and her four cubs. Um, she had actually just killed an elk calf and they were eating it. Um, you can see this one was shot at uh, ISO 12,800. And again, when I increase the exposure some, there's definitely noise there, but it's not all that bad. I mean, on this file, if I didn't have to crop it in at all, you're really not gonna have that much of a problem with noise. I mean, there, there's noise there for sure. Don't get me wrong. You can see the noise on these bears and in the background, but it's not bad. You can still see that it's retained some detail in the fur of the animals, some eye detail in the bears. I mean, it's, it's still retained a lot of detail in the file, even at ISO 12,800. And I think if you're not gonna crop it all, you can pretty safely shoot all the way up at 12,800 and get files that you're totally happy with and that you could go on to print and blow up large on, on screens or billboards or anything like that, which is, um, you know, pretty spectacular given how high of a megapixel count this camera has. So um, as far as high ISO handling capabilities on the R5, I am very impressed by it. No, it's not gonna be as good as your 1DX Mark II or 1DX Mark III, but those are 20 megapixel cameras. So it's a trade-off. Do you want high megapixels or do you want good high ISO handling capabilities? You're gonna get it better on the uh, 1DX series, but you're not gonna get as many megapixels. And honestly, I think for most people, you're gonna be more than satisfied with the ISO handling capabilities on the R5. Given that these are 45 megapixel files, the R5 does a phenomenal job handling high ISO. And while I'm on the subject of ISO, I should mention that the new ISO dial that Canon has introduced on the back of the R5 is super, super helpful, um, especially for wildlife when you have these, you know, fleeting moments that we're trying to capture, these split seconds. We need to be able to adjust those settings very quickly without ever taking our eye away from the viewfinder. With this new dial, um, you're now able to just put your thumb on that dial and turn it and adjust your ISO so very easily, very quickly, and uh, adjust with the scene as it is developing, which is again, super helpful for wildlife and a really nice new inclusion on the R5. Now let me interject here to let you all know that I'm gonna be giving away a free trip to Yellowstone National Park to photograph wildlife in the fall of 2022. I'm gonna be announcing some more details on this soon, but all you have to do to be able to enter is to hit that subscribe button down below. You all know what to do. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is the autofocus system on the R5. And as most of you already know, Animal Eye autofocus was introduced on this camera and it was totally groundbreaking. Everyone was talking about it and um, it was really a game changer for wildlife photography. Um, and for those of you that don't know what Animal Eye AF is, essentially what happens is the camera selects the animal's eye, focuses on that point, and then follows the eye through the entirety of the frame, which obviously for wildlife photographers is really powerful because then you're not having to move around your focus point. With this, it just locks onto the eye and it follows it. It is honestly phenomenal, guys. It is groundbreaking and it really revolutionizes wildlife photography. And I've gotten to the point now to where I rely on it, I would say at least 75 to 80% of the time, but it isn't flawless. It, it definitely doesn't always lock focus on the eye, especially when you get into low light lighting conditions. Um, it typically is locking focus on the head if you're lucky, um, and then typically more like just locked focus on the entire body, um, as opposed to right on the eye when you get into super low light. And um, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, they find that 
it struggles when there's not much contrast between the eye and the fur, but that's actually not really what I've seen out of this uh, system. Um, for me, what I've mainly seen is that it struggles when uh, you're trying to photograph an animal that the system wasn't designed around. Um, and the system was designed around dogs, cats, and birds. So when I'm shooting an animal that looks like a dog, a cat, or a bird, you know, like a wolf maybe, um, I found that it works super well. It typically locks right onto the eye. Or even if I'm shooting animals like bears, it works really well. It'll lock onto the eye of bears really well because they do kind of have that similar body shape to a dog or a cat. Even though there's not much contrast between the eye and the fur on a bear, you know, both are pretty dark, it still works really well on bears. Um, where I find that it struggles is on animals that the system wasn't designed around, on animals that uh, don't look anything like dogs, cats, or birds. When I'm shooting animals like pronghorn or um, elk or bison, that's when I find that animal eye AF struggles the most. Um, even though, you know, there's more contrast in between like the eye and the fur of an elk than there is the eye and the fur of a black bear, it still works better on a black bear, I find, despite that lack of contrast, because the bear looks more like a dog as opposed to an elk that really looks nothing like a dog. So the camera ends up focusing more on the head or maybe the antlers or sometimes even just the whole body than it does on the eye. So um, IAF definitely is really good and I've been very impressed by it. IAF is going to work for you most of the time, but you should still be using the other methods as backups. Um, and getting into some of the other methods, you know, as far as zone AF and uh, single point spot AF on this camera, uh, those work flawlessly. Focus is lightning fast. Occasionally, there's a little bit of slowdown in low light conditions, but rarely. Um, typically, it is lightning fast with the R5, and um, you will get, you know, totally accurate results with single point or zone AF. Wherever you put that point or put that zone of points, it is going to focus and it is going to maintain focus and it's not gonna miss. It's gonna do a phenomenal job. Um, it doesn't matter if the animal is moving sideways, if it's coming towards you, if it's going away from you, it's gonna lock focus on it when you're using one of those. Um, the only times that I really notice that it misses is with Animal Eye AF. But overall, despite the slight problems that I do have with Animal Eye AF, I am blown away by the autofocus system on the Canon R5. I mean, Animal Eye AF works almost all the time, and when it doesn't, one of the other methods works flawlessly. And if you're interested, I actually did do a video talking about how you can optimize the Canon R5's autofocus system to be the best that it can possibly be for wildlife photography and to maximize the amount of sharp shots that you get. Um, and I'll link that up here and uh, also down in the description description if you want to check that out. Um, but moving on now from autofocus, the next thing that I want to talk about is the frame rate on the Canon R5. So when you're shooting with the mechanical shutter, you get 12 frames a second. And when you're shooting with the electronic shutter on the R5, you get 20 frames a second. And it's also silent. So when you're shooting, the camera makes absolutely no sound, which is pretty cool because a, a lot of times with wildlife that, you know, you're afraid of spooking with your shutter, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can just turn on that electronic shutter and it shoots totally silently. And um, given that you're getting a frame rate of 20, I kind of want to put that into perspective for you guys. Most video is shot at 24 frames a second. So if you're maximizing this camera and you're shooting at 20 frames a second, you are shooting nearly video with 45 megapixel raw files. That's pretty spectacular that this camera is able to do that. And um, for me, honestly, I rarely use the electronic shutter because I find that 20 frames is too fast for me. For the subjects that I shoot, 12 frames a second is plenty fast enough. Now, if you shoot birds in flight or something, maybe you want to do the 20, but for me, 12 is plenty fast enough and I've you know had no problems with it on the R5 and uh, am, am really happy with the frame rate on this camera. I think it's plenty enough for wildlife and you're gonna be very satisfied with it, what you're getting at a frame rate. Um, now there is something to be aware of with that. Um, when you're shooting with the electronic shutter, sometimes you do get the rolling shutter effect, which um, basically is where you get a little bit of a stretching of your photo um, if you're panning super fast with the camera. Um, now I haven't shot much in electronic shutter, as I said, so this isn't something that I've had any experience with, but it is something that I've seen people, you know, go out into the field and test this camera for, and they have found photos with the rolling shutter effect, you know, having an effect on the photo and stretching it out. So that's something to be aware of. But like I said, for most cases, unless you're shooting super fast birds in flight, 12 frames a second is going to be plenty enough for you. And because that's shooting on the mechanical shutter, you have no worries about any kind of rolling shutter. Now, given that you're shooting 20 frames a second, 45 megapixel files, you can imagine that you're shooting super, super high volumes of data very, very quickly here. So you're gonna to have to have a buffer that can handle that. You're gonna to have to have a buffer on this camera that can handle these massive amounts of data that you're pumping out as you're just, you know, rapid firing on that camera. And um, honestly, for the R5, I have had no problems with the buffer. I've never hit the buffer. Now, again, I don't often shoot at 20 frames a second, but on 12 frames a second, I've shot, you know, 10 second long bursts, five second long bursts on it probably, and 
have never hit the buffer, never had any issue. I've really been blown away by that as well, which is really good because obviously, again, with wildlife, when we're shooting these high frame rates, we're going to need a big buffer. We're going to need to be able to fill up the camera with lots of shots and constantly be pumping out these shots as the wildlife is moving. So not hitting the buffer is a great sign. And even though I've never hit the buffer, I have heard from other YouTubers that they were able to get in around 200 shots um, for about 10 seconds before they hit the buffer shooting on the electronic shutter. But even then there was barely any slowdown and the buffer was able to clear out very quickly. So they were able to continue shooting almost immediately. So as far as buffer capacity on this camera, I would say that's nothing to worry about. Um, for wildlife photography, you're going to be able to capture all the shots you want without ever really having any issues hitting that buffer. Next, we're going to get into what is kind of the first downside on this camera, and that is the battery life. Um, this is one aspect of the camera that I would say has suffered a lot between, you know, the jump from DSLR to mirrorless. Canon's professional DSLRs are going to last a lot longer on the batteries. Um, the R5 just exhausts batteries very, very quickly. I mean, I would say in a day of, of good shooting where all day long I've got wildlife in front of me and I'm shooting all day long, I can pretty easily exhaust two batteries um, in that day with, without much trouble. I mean, it, it definitely eats the battery, the R5 does. And um, it's not bad enough that, you know, I've ever had to stop mid-shoot to go charge batteries or anything like that, but it definitely eats them up pretty fast and it's something to be aware of. And uh, it, it is, you know, to the point to where Personally, I don't go out to shoot without having at least two batteries on me because I know how easy it is to burn one up. Um, so I would say you need at least two batteries when you buy this camera, if not, you know, three or four, because it is going to burn the battery up pretty darn quickly. And, uh, you know, that is the one kind of downside that you have here. Um, it definitely doesn't last as long as your um, older DSLRs, the 1DX, the 5D Mark IV, all those. Um, you're not gonna get the same battery life out of the R5. So battery life is something to be aware of. It's not terrible, but it's definitely not good by any means either. Now next I wanna talk about something else new that Canon introduced with this camera, and that is the in-body stabilization. In-body stabilization in this thing is phenomenal. I've been able to shoot, you know, handhold with these big telephoto lens, insanely low shutter speeds, and pull off extremely, extremely sharp photos. As you can see here in this photo, I know this is not wildlife, but uh, this is a good showcase of this. I was shooting at 100 millimeters at 1 13th of a second and was able to get tack sharp photos out of this camera with that in-body stabilization. I mean, you really can't go wrong with the in-body stabilization on this. The shooting at 100 millimeters, 1 13th of a second, handheld was kind of unheard of until you got a camera like the R5. And you're gonna be able to shoot insanely low shutter speeds, even with telephoto lenses and get tack sharp shots. The main thing that's gonna be restricting you is no longer gonna be, you know, the movement of your body with that big telephoto lens. Now what's restricting you is the movement of the animal, if the animal is moving too fast. So really was blown away by in-body stabilization and uh, really opens up the world to shooting much lower shutter speeds and uh, you know shooting in much more low light conditions um, with telephoto lenses and still getting tack sharp shots which is going to be really awesome for wildlife now i also want to talk about the viewfinder experience on this camera because it is a mirrorless camera so you're looking through this electronic viewfinder at a screen in the viewfinder and a lot of people didn't like this you know when mirrorless cameras first were released but on the r5 I find it just as good as, if not better, than your DSLR viewfinders. I mean, it projects a beautiful high quality image in there and uh, there's absolutely no lag in the image as the animal moves around. It's it's totally fluid and smooth and looks like you're looking through a DSLR viewfinder. It's flawless in that regard. And the ability to now have the live exposure updating in the viewfinder is crucial for wildlife photography because when we're shooting in these conditions in the outdoors where we have constantly changing, unpredictable, uncontrollable light and we have fast moving animals, we want to be able to see what our exposure is doing constantly. And with that electronic viewfinder showing you your live exposure as you shoot, we're able to do that. We're able to constantly adjust those settings and tweak those settings and see visually the changes that we're making in the viewfinder to adjust for the changing light and the moving wildlife um, moving into different lights. So the live exposure in these electronic viewfinders is really, really helpful for wildlife photography. And uh, one thing that I love about this camera, and I think is one of the most underrated features on this camera, is the histogram in the viewfinder. You now don't even have to look at the back of your camera anymore. You don't even have to pull your eye away from the viewfinder. You can just put the histogram up in the top corner of your viewfinder and make sure that you're not crushing your blacks or blowing out your whites which is phenomenal. And like I said, one of the most underrated features on this camera, in my opinion. And one thing that we should also talk about with the viewfinder is electronic viewfinder blackout, which is something that was a lot bigger of a problem on older mirrorless cameras. It has been improved with this camera, 
but when shooting on the mechanical shutter, I definitely still notice it sometimes. Um, if you switch up to electronic, it's really not an issue at all. You don't really see any blackout, but on mechanical, there is still a little bit of one. It's not bad unless you're shooting like birds in flight on the mechanical shutter. You're not even going to notice it that much but it is there, it is there in the slightest. Uh, I have noticed it a little bit. I wanna just talk briefly about video on the Canon R5. I know this is mainly centered around wildlife photography, but the video capabilities are so good here that I do just wanna mention a few things about them. Um, so basically on this camera, you're able to shoot in 8K raw video, 4K 120 frames a second, and 4K 60 frames a second and 30 frames a second, which is unheard of for a camera like this. Typically, you know, that's the type of specs that you see on a $20,000 cinema camera. And this isn't a $20,000 cinema camera. This is a $4,000 mirrorless camera. So for it to be able to shoot 8K raw video, 4K 120 is groundbreaking and phenomenal. And I, I'm really impressed by that on this camera. And while I don't use 8K that much, I do use 4K 120 when I can, and it's very impressive on this camera. And um, it does take up a lot of space on your memory card, so be prepared to have a large memory card. Um, but it's, it's really impressive. And uh, all the footage that I film on this is always tack sharp, clean looking, and um, really, especially with the in-body stabilization, ends up being very smooth and good looking. And um, I've, I've never been disappointed by the video I've gotten out of the R5 so far. And last thing that I should touch on here is the overheating issue that you hear a lot of people talking about with this camera. Personally, I've shot a pretty good amount of video with this camera and I've never faced an issue with overheating. I have had times where it's got pretty hot to the touch, but I've never had it overheat before. So while I do think there's an issue to be aware of, I definitely think that it was blown out of proportion when the camera first came out. For me, and honestly for most people that I've talked to, the overheating issue has really not been too big of a deal when shooting video on the R5. So that was the last really big topic that I wanted to talk about for this camera. Now I'm gonna move into some other smaller important topics. First of all, as memory cards, you have one slot for a CF Express card and one slot for an SD card. And it should be noted that as expensive as they might be, you are gonna need a CF Express card to be able to maximize the potential of this camera to get those 20 frames a second burst and to get that huge buffer, you're gonna need one of these cards that has you know a super fast write speed. So that's definitely something to invest in when you go to purchase this camera as well. And next, I wanna talk a little bit about weather sealing. Personally, I haven't shot this camera too much in snow or rain, but for the few times that I have, I haven't had any issues with the weather sealing on it. It was able to get pretty wet and had really no issues. But to be honest, for me, it doesn't matter how good Canon says that weather sealing is, I'm not gonna risk it either way. If I'm stuck out in harsh conditions, I'm gonna throw on that $20 piece of plastic over my camera. Rather than risk a $4,000 camera, there's just no need to take that risk, at least in my opinion. Um, so I think that I got everything in there. Um, that was a lot, but uh, you know, I had a lot that I wanted to say about this camera. And uh, honestly, I truly believe that this camera is the best wildlife photography camera that Canon has ever put out. Um, from the high ISO handling capabilities to the groundbreaking autofocus system, to the sensors quality and the high megapixel count. This camera is honestly a camera that I'm in love with and that I will be shooting with at least until Canon releases an R5 Mark II. There are a few problems, like I said, the animal eye autofocus isn't always perfect and uh, battery life isn't ideal, but overall I am totally blown away by this camera and think that it is, again, one of the best wildlife photography cameras on the market. And um, if you are looking to shoot Canon and you're looking to upgrade it to the best possible Canon camera for wildlife photography, look no farther, I promise you, it is the Canon R5. So with that, guys, I wanna remind you to subscribe for that Yellowstone trip giveaway. More details on that coming soon. And I'm gonna be giving away one of my 2022 calendars to someone who comments on this video. So comment your thoughts down below for a chance to win and drop a like if you don't care, that'd be much appreciated. Um, stay tuned guys. Um, I'm gonna be going back to Yellowstone for at least three months, possibly eight months in May. So that's gonna be amazing. And um, I'm also gonna be reviewing the Canon R3 for wildlife photography here in just a few weeks. So lots of awesome stuff coming up on the channel pretty soon here. So with that guys, I think that's all for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I really do hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Don't forget to drop a comment for your chance to win a calendar and I will see you all in the next one. <music>